the Lord of the Rings was an idea uh, that came from us. I'd read the book when I was 17 and thought, wow, this would make a pretty cool film. Can't wait to see the film. Um, but of course the film didn't really come. Cart there was a, sort of a cartoon version of it uh, popped up at some point that wasn't, didn't work particularly well. But um, we'd got through a movie called The Frighteners in New Zealand, uh, which was a big effects film, had about 500 um, computer effects shots, and we'd done that ourselves. We, we, we're very self-sufficient in New Zealand. We're so far away from everywhere else that you know, we tend to just think, you know, if, if, it, if it's a film that needs a lot of CG, CG computer work, we can't go down the road to hire Sony or, or Digital Domain or ILM to do our shots. We were in New Zealand, and even back in those days where there wasn't the communication that there is today, it's like, well, this means that we're going to have to get a lot of computers and do them ourselves, so okay. So we, we sort of always have a, we have a very self-sufficient um, attitude where, where we are that basically don't expect... To, to be able to pull in rental equipment or anything else, buy buy the gear, maintain it, you know, just own it, and and um, that, and just get on with your filmmaking. So, so we've done that over the years, and um, in this particular time, which was uh, November '95, um, I'd come, I, I'd gotten, we'd gotten about you know two thirds of the way through the post production on. Um, the Frighteners, starting to relax a little bit, starting to think about our next project because I always like to know what I'm doing next after, by the time I finish a film. And our, our, I didn't ha we didn't have a project, but we had these computers all sitting there that had been pu purchased for The Frighteners and were going to become available. And I've, I'd always had an, a desire to want to do a fantasy film. I mean, I grew up with these Ray Harryhausen films, Jason and the Argonauts, K Kong, you know, I wanted to do something fantastical, and uh, I thought that that would be so f much fun to take that sort of Sinbad genre and combine it with computer effects. Because um, Jurassic Park had come out, we'd seen the great dinosaurs had now been done, but to actually take fantastical monsters and, and a swashbuckling heroes and something like Sinbad and do a movie like that I thought would be really neat. So I started to think about that being our, our next film after Frighteners and um, need, needed to write a story, didn't have a story and started to talk to Fran about it and um, and we kept referencing Lord of the Rings all the time. We just kept thinking, well, you know, saying, well, it's got to be like Lord of the Rings or it should be a, a bit, you know, just like that bit in Lord of the Rings, it's got to, something like that's got to happen. And after a few days of doing this, we, we, we thought, well, why don't we find out about Lord of the Rings. We talk about it all the time and it was just an absolute assumption that Lord of the Rings would be tied up unavailable. You know, just assume that. I mean, it's such a big title. And, um, but I thought it was, I thought it was worth a phone call. So eventually I called my agent and said, could he find out who, who has got the Lord of the Rings rights? And he made the inquiries, called back and said that they were with a producer called Saul's aunts and that Saul has had the rights for 20 odd years and um, got them off of Tolkien himself and Saul is not really wanting a live action film to happen he, he's, he, had, he was badly burnt on the um, on the cartoon version and really he's not entertaining you know ideas of, of, of people coming to him with you know he's, he, he has people constantly coming to him wanting these, these rights and he doesn't really entertain them the notion, so you probably won't get very far. But um, we had a first look deal with Miramax at that stage. We were in a first look deal, which meant anything we had to do, we we want, want, or anything we wanted to do, we had to go to Miramax and offer it to them first. So I thought it was worthwhile calling Harvey Weinstein at Miramax and just seeing how interested he was in, in the Lord of the Rings. And he said he said he was interested. And then when he heard that Saul's aunts had the rights, he said, "Well, that's going to be no problem. I can I can get those off Saul." because he was doing The English Patient with Saul's aunts at the time. It was exactly when The English Patient was being shot. And um, he, and he said, Saul, I bailed Saul out of, out of The English Patient. I've done huge favours for him. He's going to return the favour. He's going to give me the Lord of the Rings rights. So Harvey immediately was using, because he, he had rescued Saul, Fox had put um, English Patient to turn around and basically killed the movie. It was de dead and, and Harvey had come in and taken it over and resuscitated the film. So 
there was definitely a debt there, and and however Harvey used that debt, he he did get Saul to agree to um, license the rights for a period of time to Miramax, and Miramax didn't want to do three movies. We did pitch the idea to them of doing three, but they just they just wanted one or two, and so we we started developing a two part um, script where the first part would end at the Battle of Helm's Deep, but it was like a, a big a big script. Uh, two big scripts, fat, big, epic films, the two of them. Following the books, ending, uh, ending the first one ended at Helm's Deep, um, which is sort of about halfway through, and then the next one would carry on. So yeah, yeah pretty much following the books. Um, and anyway, we started to budget these films now, and Miramax were giving us money for the writing and giving us money for the, the production design starting to work, and so we were in a sort of, had, had a lot of information happening. There were lots of designs, lots of characters were being sort of sculpted in this market form. And um, they, it, it simply just got too expensive, basically, for Miramax. And they'd always been open with us. I mean, Harvey said that he couldn't spend more than 70, 75 million per picture, that Disney, had, Disney, who owned him, had put a cap on the amount of money he could spend. And, and, um, and he, was, he was wanting to... Um, yeah, you know, for these films to be less than seventy-five million, and, and, and we tried, and then then he found out that that they weren't going to be able, they weren't going to accept part one and part two as two different films that they that are, you know costing seventy-five million each that they wanted this they treated as one film and they didn't want to spend one hundred and fifty million on these two films they wanted just seventy-five million. So Harvey was in a stuck in a really bad place, and he came to us and said, "Listen, you know the only thing I can do is to is to basically." Um, make one movie and you guys are going to have to support me here, I've supported you, you're going to have to now do the right thing and you're going to have to cut the script down to one film, $75 million. And I said, is it like the first of three? Could we just do the first one? No, no, it's going to be the whole Lord of the Rings as one movie, $75 million and um, it has to happen now. And I just said, I don't think I can do that, Harvey. I don't think I can do it. I don't think you can actually, you know, collapse all this into one film, get rid of so much stuff that you couldn't even call it Lord of the Rings. It would be a Reader's Digest, Lord of the Rings. I, it just wouldn't feel right. It wouldn't be something I'd want to have my, na my name on. I mean, I was wanting to make Lord of the Rings, not, not some, some horrible cut-down thing. Everybody who's read this book is going to be disappointed. There's no doubt about it. They, they will be let down, everybody. You're taking the most, the, you know, debatably the most popular favourite book in the world, and you're making a film, a film that is guaranteed to disappoint everybody who is familiar with the book. Well, not that many people have read the book, you know. Well, 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 we won't worry about that. You know, it was like relying on the fact that more people hadn't read the book than had, and wouldn't know the um, the crimes that we committed, cutting it down. So anyway, I just said we were in New York in the office, the Miramax sweat box they call it, hot, nasty little room, windowless room in the middle of the Tribeca office he's got. And, Oh, we just said we just wanted to go to go home. Fran and I, we were just sick of the whole thing, sick of Harvey and the shenanigans, and we just said, uh, "Listen, we'll have a think about it on the flight home, Harvey. All right, and just give us, you know, a day or two. We're flying home this afternoon. Let us go, and we'll just um, give it some thought and give you a call back." And then we we flew home, having no intention of doing this film. We were so kind of um, so sort of defeated, really. It was Fran's birthday when we got home, so we just went off to this hotel up the country just to have a, a quiet, get away from it all, away from the phones, everything else, a quiet, um, a quiet little birthday weekend. Um, but I did take a cell phone, and my agent did ring at one stage, and he'd spoken to Harvey and he, and Ken, Ken Cammons, and Ken had said to Harvey, listen, you know, Peter and Fran have given up a year and a half of their lives on this so far. You can't just... Um, Tell them that that they can't do this because basically we were said no to the to one movie thing and we were being thrown off the project. And Harvey was going to find someone else to make the one movie version. Ken said, "Listen, you know, you, you can't just discard them when they bought the idea to you. It was their idea to start with. They have certain moral rights here, and um, what you have to do is at least give them a period of time in which they can set the film up somewhere else." And um, and so Harvey agreed to that, and we basically found ourselves in a position where we had four weeks to find another studio who would commit to three movies. 
um, and commit to the budget figures that we had and, and read the scripts that we'd written. The scripts would have to be rewritten if it was going to be three, but, but nonetheless, you give an idea from the script. So we went through this process of, um, of sending the scripts to everybody in LA, everybody in Hollywood, some people in London. Only two people replied, which was New Line and um, um, uh, New Line and um, Polygram. Um, and Polygram were being sold at that stage, and they're an English company, and they said that they love to do Lord of the Rings, but they couldn't deal with it until the sales process. They were going to have a new buyer soon, a new owner. And until that it all settled down, and we said, well, we've only got four weeks. Well, there was three weeks now. Harvey's only given us three weeks. We've got a ticking clock. So they immediately sort of dropped out, leaving us with only one option. I mean, everybody else passed, passed just on the, the notion of it. So the, the script was sent out to every studio in town, and everybody passed apart from Polygram and New Line. And Polygram um, had to pass very quickly anyway because they were being sold and they wanted four or five weeks to finish the sales process before they could decide. And they were very keen on it, but we just said we can't wait those four or five weeks. Um, so that just left us with New Line. And Mark Odeski, who was, was an old friend of mine, I'd written a, a, a Nightmare on Elm, Elm Street script for them some years earlier and I had worked with Mark on that. and so. He and I knew each other. I knew he was a big Lord of the Rings fan because he, he had Lord of the Rings posters up around his apartment. I remember when I used to sleep on his couch um, in the old days when I came over here. And so uh, Mark was a champion for the, for the project and, and got it through Uline. We had a meeting with Bob Shea. Um, and Bob basically at that meeting, you know, we'd, he looked at the scripts and the various bits of artwork and a, a videotape that we'd put together and it was in Bob's words were well you know why would why would people want to pay why, why would you want to why would you want to charge nine dollars to see this when you could charge twenty seven dollars is the words that he used and I thought what's he talking about I, I, it was a little bit of a, of a mental puzzle and then I realized he was thinking about three movies I said you, you, you mean three movies yeah the Tolkien wrote three books well shouldn't we do three movies so they were immediately embracing they saw the potential that if this was going to be as good as they hoped it would be, you'd want three of these movies, not one. You'd want $27, not $9. And so um, Bob knew pretty much had that figured out from the very beginning, which was great. It was great that like our first meeting at a company, we felt this company finally got it, finally understood what we wanted to do after this terribly, terribly frustrating time at, time at Miramax. And so um, we then embarked on another round of pre-production. We had to basically rewrite the scripts again. We had to now write three three movie scripts. So each of the scripts had to have a beginning, middle, and end, and be structured as a satisfying script. So had to tear everything apart and start all over again. Carry on uh, de developing, um, and then finally, you know, we got to that day, did casting, and got to the day of shoot. The, the day of shooting, which was the 11th of November, 1999. Um, that first day of shoot was the I, I, it was three years since I'd made that phone call, um, the first phone call asking about Lord of the Rings. It was three years to get us to that place. Three years spent doing a lot of design work, a lot of conceptual work, location scouting. We were pretty well prepared. I mean, we we you know we it, 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 even though it was three movies being shot back to back, the three years of preparation was fantastic because we knew what we were doing, we knew how we were going to do it, and we were a very, very well-organized group of people. New Line were prepared to take the risk to, 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 to fund the filming of all three because that's what was going to be so much cheaper for them. We build sets once, we just shoot the set, which sometimes some sets appeared in all three films, a few, a few of them, some appeared in two films, um, and, you, and you're done. And... Uh, you also have the actors on a deal so that they, they can't, you don't make one movie, because what, often what happens with franchises is you make one movie, the first one's very successful, and then the actors come back and they want twice the amount of money now because they're in a successful film. And, you know, fair enough, I don't have anyth anything, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but, but if this was a danger with this pro project for three movies, so, um, so New Line, you know, had the actors contracted as one, they basically as one big job, and we knew, we knew it was three movies, but it was like they're getting paid for a job, and they're getting paid at the rate that they were at that time. 
So like, even though Orlando Bloom's career rocketed through the three Lord of the Rings films, he was still getting paid exactly the same on the third one as he was on the first, even though he was getting a lot more money, you know, being offered to him for, for, for other films. And so the economics of it, uh, the, it, it it's quick, quicker. You, go, you get a m momentum going, it'll be quicker to shoot. Um, you don't have to wrap and have post-production and then start up a pre-production again, do that three times. You just sort of sit, sit up, go and stop. And Anyway, it was, it was certainly much cheaper to do it that way. And, and, but the downside of it is a risk. The downside is if the first film fails, then you've squandered the money for the other two. So that was, you know, that comes at its price. We did change Aragorn after we started shooting, but um, that's just because we felt we had to. Uh, we weren't happy with our first choice for him, but we made that decision in the first week of shooting because we just knew we knew if this went on, it was going to be turned into a total nightmare. And in that regard, you know, I think on a normal film we wouldn't have done that. We would have thought, okay, we'll get through a, f a few weeks with this guy. We'll make it work somehow, it'll be okay. But the, the fact we were facing 18 months of shooting, we, we just had to have people who are 100% committed, 100% nice people who we felt we could comfortably work with. I mean, yeah, casting the, the human beings, you know, who were actors, but, but casting them as humans was so important. Casting them as people that we got to know and feel whether they would survive in New Zealand for 18 months without being driven crazy whether they'd be supportive of the film. And I think what, what happened is we got a really incredible group of people and who had great loyalty. And I, and I think, because I thought about it afterwards, and I, I thought that really the, what, what the dynamic has done is, it, is, it's, um, is now we've ended up with people that are really thinking, well, if I've, got a, if I've, if I've committed to a movie that's gonna, I'm going to spend 18 months of my life on it, um, it's, it's going to have to be pretty bloody good. I don't want to spend 18 month, months on a, on a dud. And so everybody showed up on set every day with a spirit of let's make this as good as it can be because, oh man, this is a big piece of my life and I don't want to see this going to waste on a bad movie. So that spirit of let's make this as good as we can um, ne never went away. It was actually just some, it was a spirit that was there in the production the whole time. I'd always wanted to make a fantasy film because I used to love those films when I was a kid, um, and I was, you know, one was ones with monsters and ogres and trolls and sword fighting and big battles and castles. I mean, just that whole, um, that whole thing. That, that was one of the worlds that I loved the, the most, really. And uh, and so it just happened to end up being Lord of the Rings, the big granddaddy of them all. Um, ended up being our subject matter, but it was certainly, I, I, it was a, it was a project that I, it was a, it was a genre that I'd wanted to to do and um, and it, but but I, I I'd, I'd always thought Lord of the Rings was a bit unattainable I thought it was out of our reach especially when you're down New Zealand you're not ever going to think you're going to get a chance to make Lord of the Rings you don't even dream about it you think you're going to write an original story you know Lord of the Rings ish type of fantasy story um, that's what that's what I assumed would happen so King Kong is one of my, in my view, one of the great pieces of escapist entertainment. I, you know, it, it has everything that's wonderful about escapist cinema. It's got monsters, it's got intrigue, adventure, action, lost islands, uh, dinosaurs, gorillas, um, and then at its heart it's got a, a wonderful love story. It's a romantic very romantic story about a gorilla who's who's had no empathy with any other creature, and his and his he ta his heart is lost to to Anne Darrow to this to this young woman, and um, and it is a it's a, it's a it's a bittersweet, sad story, uh, whilst being this you know wonderful adventure, and um, and and I really just wanted to I I, I was I'm a huge fan of the first original film, but that didn't make me feel like, you know, this film should never be remade. I, I don't think like that. I mean, there's nothing, the film is not in any danger. And in fact, you know, we, we um, the production of our film ultimately inspired uh, uh, Warner Brothers to finally do a lovely DVD restoration for King Kong. And it was, you know, no, no 
coincidence that it was released just as our film was coming out. They released a, a wonderfully restored version of King Kong, which had never been out on DVD in the US before. So that was good. Um, it was good that we caused that to happen. Um, but the the um, my, my feeling also is that there is a lot of kids today who don't watch black and white films. I mean, you you ask for a show of hands of who's watched King Kong, you know, some people will put their hands up and almost all of them will, will have watched the Jessica Lange version from 1976. That's their King Kong. That's the one in colour that they see on TV. Hardly anyone would have watched the 1933 film. That's just the reality, whether you like it or not, it's just the fact that, you know, these films are not enjoyed anymore by kids who think they're old-fashioned and they just have no patience for that sort of stuff. So I just thought this is a wonderful story. The time is now here, both from the point of view of nobody sees King Kong anymore and the fact that the technology has now got so potent and such so, so powerful, the um, computing power that we have, that Kong can be done in a totally photorealistic way. Um, and we, you know, we set out to preserve as much about the original film as we could in the sense of the 1933 setting and the Depression, which is a very important part of the story, and I didn't want to lose that. Um, I wanted the Empire State Building with him being attacked by biplanes, so I wanted to sit in the 30s again for that reason. We built a, a very small back lot of New York and New Zealand, a very small bunch of streets that are only about 20 foot tall buildings. And then uh, they were used for all our street level stuff for the actors. And then we would use CG extensions to make the buildings go higher. And then the actual aerial shots where we're flying around the Empire State Building, that all of Manhattan is built in the computer, one, one building at a time. In fact, we didn't e even have enough time. There's 78,000 buildings there and we didn't have enough time to have a, a person model each building. It just couldn't have done it. We didn't have enough, too, too many buildings and not enough people. And so we, de we, developed a, uh, we developed a piece of software in the computer and the computer constructed the city for us. We, we put in a bunch of architectural styles of different buildings, sandstones, you know, brownstones and apartment blocks and business places and banks. And, and we put a street map of New York in and we labelled each street in the computer with the type of buildings it would have. Uh, the sort of ranges of, of, of heights that we would need. And we literally pressed the button and the computer program went through and built the city for us. We, we'd written this piece of um, city building software uh, because we couldn't, you know, we didn't have enough manpower to do the whole thing. Um, Empire State Building we obviously built very re realistically, got the original blueprints of the building. Um, the the airplanes, the Curtis Hell Divers, d don't exist anymore. They were the planes that attacked attack Kong in the 1933 film, and I thought we'd find one in a museum somewhere that we could copy. But um, they're actually all they're all gone. There's not one single surviving Curtis Hell Diver anymore. So we had to go back to the factory drawings from, we got out of the Smithsonian or from the Curtis factory, and we um, we recreated the planes from the drawings. Kong uh, is. A wild animal. Uh, we wanted to not make him unduly cute, um, you know. And he's a, he's a terrifying, frightening animal who is unpredictable, uh, full of rage. Um, and so that was really, you know, the main priority for us was to establish him in, as a very frightening, scary creature. And then we were able to that starting at that point, we were able to then just peel away little moments of the facade at times and reveal a heart and a soul and something more caring underneath that. And I think that Anne just, you know, Anne who he had every intention of killing when he first takes her away into the jungle, she manages to survive on something, some sort of cunning and, and, and wit that she has, but he, she, she basically sparks his interest, and, and while he's curious about her, she, he'll stay alive. She realizes if, if she can just keep him curious and keep him wondering and keep him entertained to some degree, then he won't kill her. And, um, and then that develops into, the, the tables really turn when, um, when it, you, you reach a point where Kong is now fear, He's, he's now fearful that Anne's going to be taken away or be hurt, and so he, 
he goes into a protective mode. And at that point, the power shift has happened. Because what's interesting is there's, you know, Kong, Kong has an immense power over Anne, but then the moment in the story where he now is going to do anything he can to protect her is the power shifted to her, really, that Anne now has power over Kong. And that's ultimately his downfall, of course, because once he's in this super protective mode that any, anybody tries to take her away, he's going to, you know, come after them. That is going to lead to his demise. It sort of has to, really. Andy has become, you know, he's become uh, somebody, an, an actor who is a very, very intrigued by motion capture. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, I mean, he, he did Gollum and now he's done Kong and he just loves, he loves performance. I mean, he's a powerful actor just by himself. You see him in films and TV stuff that he's done. He is just, you know, Andy is a very strong actor and a very full of aggression and rage and, and power, and he, he's actually pretty formidable. Um, and he's just fascinated by channeling that through the process of motion capture, through the computers, and, and allowing it to be translated onto the face of a completely different creature. I think he finds that fascinating. Um, and it is an interesting way of shooting a film, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a way of filmmaking that, that's gonna get much more common Rather than uh, rather than not, because it allows you to get performance out of any cr any creature that you really w want to get performance out of. Um, you you were always a little bit at the risk of you know if it was just animators animating the face of a creature, you you're not you're 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 getting an animation, but you're not necessarily getting a great performance. And I mean, the, I think what we've shown with Gollum and with Kong is that at the heart of any great performance is an actor is a human actor. And we've tried to develop a pipeline that allows everything that's good and strong about that actor's performance to be preserved and translated and captured and kept and, and contained within our CG performance, not dissipated. Um, and I think that's the lesson, really. I don't think any other companies are doing that. Other than us, say, other companies tend to just you know animate their characters, but we try to have them driven by the spirit of a human being, and that spirit I think is is important. I grew up in a little town in New Zealand at the bottom of the North Island called Pukarua Bay. It had about 800 people, but it was a very um, I mean, I look back on it as being very romantic, but it, it, it was. It's a, it's a, it's a, something like something of a Wuthering Heights, like Goonies type town, right on the edge of the coast. Thundering waves um, along the beach. There's stone caves um, inside the mountains. There's lots of hills, waterfalls, streams going down. Houses perched in amongst hills. Our house was on the, the edge of a cliff that sort of plummeted right down into the ocean, and it was a children's playground, an adventure playground. Um, I was an only child, so I, I didn't have brothers and sisters, spent a lot of time by myself reading books, imagining, and I used to imagine adventures taking place in the area that I was in. I, I was convinced at some point I'd be going through some of the bush and into a stream and I'd find an old flintlock uh, a, a gun from the 1800s that somebody had dropped. I was convinced on one of, one of my journeys I'd stumble across, a, across an old gun, which was always in my head when I was going scrambling around, but I never actually did. That like, would have been cool. It was my dream to find an old, an old musket. Um, but nonetheless, it, it was a sort. It was a. It was a, a childhood that I, was full of this stimulus of, of this environment in which I lived, which was fantastic. I used to do things like. Uh, you know, without my parents knowing, and being a parent now, I'd be horrified, but when I was about eight or nine, some friends and I got into this routine where we would wake up at three o'clock in the morning, tap on our windows, you know, because we lived down the street, tap on, on the window, we'd get out, we'd get dressed, we'd climb on our bikes, and we'd go, and we'd go biking up and down the hills and down to the beach and around at three o'clock in the morning, um, just a group of us, and then by four o'clock, go back, Get, get undressed, get back in our jammies and go back to sleep again. And parents had no idea that we were doing this. We'd have these sort of midnight ad adventures. And they were just like adventures out of um, uh, Enid Blyton, who's a famous British author, wrote children's adventure stories, Famous Five, Secret Seven, and, um, and, and we were sort of in heavily into that world. 
and um, that was that was how I grew up. And and uh, as I as I did that, I was beginning to get interested in film through. But that came through watching Thunderbirds on TV, the British TV show Thunderbirds. When I was about five, our parents got TV. When I was five, it was I remember arriving in the lounge in a cardboard box and Dad having to screw the wooden legs into the set, and this old black and white Phillips set. And so um, from five I had TV, watched Thunderbirds, was really captivated by the fantasy elements and, and, and the, the, that TV show has lots of models of spaceships and um, inter interesting sort of uh, um, gimmicks and gadgets. It's a, it's a great TV show, very, very... Uh, inventive and imaginative, and then I the the next thing that happened really is um, seeing King Kong, the original King Kong, when I was nine, and that film really accelerated a, a, a burgeoning interest in um, in special effects models and films, and I I could make models quite well. I used to you know make a lot of model kits when I was a kid. And I used to sometimes you know, make kits out of cardboard boxes and things. I didn't just make plastic kits. I used to sort of make, make my own models. Um, and then I, my parents got given a, a Super 8 movie camera by a friend down the road, just presented it to my parents for Christmas one year when I was about n nine. Um, this camera arrived at one Christmas, which was to, for us to do Super 8 you know, home movies, except I grabbed the camera immediately because I thought, God, now I can get my spaceships that I've ma made in my models and I can film them just like Thunderbirds. You know, I, I can have two things smashing together. I used to buy plastic model airplanes um, and set fire to them because they burn quite well. They, they have this inky black smoke comes off the plastic when you set fire to them and I used to have them going down on, 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 on cotton lines and, um, and smashing in, into the dirt bank and it used to be like a World War II Spitfire crashing out of control and um, the, the melted plastic would just be sort of sitting there smoldering away. And I, um, so I did a lot of that sort of filming. Um, I got interested in stop motion animation as a result of King Kong, Ray Harryhausen's films, uh, two Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, um, Jason and the Argonauts. They are all stop motion where you move the figure one frame at a time. And my camera didn't have the, the, a one frame button. It, it, I could only just squeeze the trigger and squirt off two or three frames before I had to move the puppet and then another f two or three frames. So it was very, very jerky animation since it uh, was very un un imprecise. Um, but anyway, it, was, it, it, it drove, this was all sort of fueling me. I, I wanted for a long time to be Ray Harryhausen's assistant when I grew, grew up and help him do stop motion animation. And um, Didn't think about directing films at this point in time. I, I just wanted to do special effects. I made World War II movies. I eventually got a Super 8 camera that, that could do single frame and I got a sound camera so I could record dialogue and I did like a World War II drama film with friends of mine in old army uniforms, kids with with big helmets and uniforms they don't fit very well running around, dug trenches in my parents' garden. They, my parents were really great and it's actually something worth talking about on this because I think unless you have the, the wholehearted support of your parents, I think any nutty kind of and and it, it, hobby or or just passion that you have you're gonna you're gonna get cold water thrown on it um you know when I was having these nutty ideas about wanting to build you know trenches in our garden help dad build uh, get dad to help me build build machine guns and uh, out of broomsticks and um and I wanted to, to make movies and to make monsters and all this and my parents I think who were very very just very gentle simple conservative people they would have probably preferred, I, they kept trying to prod me into an architecture career. Um, but nonetheless, every single thing I, I did with, with film, they supported me. They, they drove me to locations before I had my, my driver's license. They helped me get the stuff I needed to, to do, to, to do foam, foam latex. I ended up um, having to bake foam latex heads in these big plaster of Paris molds in my mum's oven. So mum couldn't cook the Sunday roast that, that Sunday. We all just had to have, you know, beans on toast or something because the oven was commandeered by me. Filling the house full of fumes, of course, to toxic fumes as the, um, as the foam latex um, cures in the oven. So uh, just very understanding parents are important. And I think that's just a good lesson for, for, um, for students here who are going to become um, parents themselves that 
I think, you know, if you want your kids to achieve in any sort of way, you have to just let them find their passions. You can't impose a, a passion onto anybody. You Somehow you're born with it or things get triggered during your childhood that, that just you just end up, you know, I mean, I, I've ended up feeling like I, I, I was, I, I, I was, have, you know, I'm, I'm here because I'm a filmmaker and I want to make films and that's been the way I felt almost since I was born. And um, I've never really thought about doing anything else. And so I had my parents supported me and, and, and that support is really important. And I often think that how many people out there have failed to achieve in later life because they didn't get that, um, they didn't get that support from their parents when they were young. And I, I've, I got through my teenage years wanting to leave school as quickly as possible, where again, I mean, I look at all the students at the academy here and it's like I'm, I'm definitely not the right mo role model <laughs> where it comes to that because I just wanted to get out of school as fast as I could. Not because I hated school, although I didn't like it. Um, I wanted to get out of school because I wanted to buy a 16 millimeter camera. This was all about the equipment. It was all about the frustration of trying to make films but not having the, the, the best gear. So uh, I had, my parents had got me a Super 8 sound camera for a Christmas present during my teenage years, which I used. But we're now getting up to a point that they couldn't expect to buy me a 16 millimeter camera for a Christmas present. And I needed a camera, which meant I needed to earn money. I just had to earn money, and so I just wanted to get out of school and into a job, any job, um, so that I could start saving up for the next piece of film equipment that I wanted. And I did, um, I did leave school at 16. I got a job at a newspaper as a photo lithographer, and during that seven years I was there, um, I basically spent two, two of the years saving up for a 16 millimeter camera, which cost several thousand dollars. And I was only getting paid 75 bucks a week. Um, I, I lived at home with my parents all this time because I couldn't afford not to. I, I just, I, I literally, they were giving me free, free board and free rent. And if it's like, if I got, if I, if all my friends were going into flats, you know, go, they were just leaving home. And but then one, I just realised that leaving home was going to become really expensive. I'd have to buy a car. I'd have to pay a landlord rent. I, it was like, how am I going to buy a camera if I've got all these outgoing? So I, I stayed at home with mum and dad, um, who didn't charge me anything to stay at home, and was able to, to save this money. Got my, got my 16 mil camera eventually after a couple of years. And, um, and at that point, I started uh, working on a film but that started out as a short movie. Um, because I wanted to try the camera out. It was a Bolex camera, 16mm spring wound camera, but quite complicated, more sophisticated than what I'd ever done. I had to set my own exposures with a, with a, with a light meter and I had to learn how to do that because all the Super 8 cameras would just, you know, auto point and shoot things. So I suddenly had to figure things out and I didn't want to waste um, any money, money at all because I realised with 16mm that three minutes of film was basically $100. By the time you've bought the roll of negative, you then have to process the negative, and then you have to get a print made off the negative. By the time you'd gone through that, back in those days, it was $100 to get this three minutes done. So this was serious now. You couldn't, you know, the Super 8 things were like $4 each. Um, so I had to be pretty serious every time I squeezed that trigger on that camera. I, I, it wasn't for fun anymore, really. Um, so I thought, OK, I need to learn how the camera works, but I'll do that by... Um, making a short film. So at least at the end of the day, I get a film out of my my tutorial, as it were. So I um, made this short film and um, figured out how the camera worked. And then and I could only film on Sundays because I had a full time job. And I had to work a sixth day overtime at the newspaper I was working at just so I could earn enough overtime paid because now to pay this these expenses of this film. So the short movie um, expanded and grew, and um, I, I thought it would be 10 minutes long and then and film it over two or three weeks. And then what, what would happen is I'd sit you know, all week in this boring job that I didn't particularly like, and my mind would just be thinking about the movie the whole, the whole time. And I'd, be, I'd come up with new ideas, the things I hadn't thought about for what we were going to shoot next Sunday. And so next Sunday would roll around, and I'd have a whole different bit of plot that I'd figured out that I wanted to do on that particular Sunday. And so the short film grew and grew and grew and expanded out over this period of time. And eventually we ended up shooting it for four years, um, Sundays uh, for four years. And I 
had had none of it cut, and then I took a two weeks leave off my off my job because I was only allowed three weeks holiday a year. So I, I, I took two weeks of my, ho my holiday. I got a very simple edit editing machine, 60 mil editing machine, and I sat on my mum's kitchen table, um, and, and they couldn't eat dinner on the table anymore. They had to eat it on their laps. So for, t and for two weeks, I just it simply edited the film that we'd been shooting over the course of the last few years. And it came to a feature length. I mean, I knew I'd shot a lot, but I thought it might have been 45 minutes or an hour, but it came to something like 75 minutes and we still had a little bit of filming to go. So at that point, after like three years of working on this film, I realized it was now a feature. I'd been com completely thinking short film, short film. And I thought, my God, I'm actually making a feature film. And um, at that point, I got some help from the New, the New Zealand Film Commission, saw it and came on board. I'd spent 17 grand of my own money uh, um, uh, to reach that point. Um, the Film Commission came on board, saw what I had, the 75 minutes, and they agreed to come in with another 30-odd grand, which would enable me to leave my job, work full-time on the film, still shoot at the weekends, but I'd be able to build the costumes and sets during the week, and it was just going to exhilarate the whole thing. And then they gave me money to finish the post-production of the film, which was 200 grand, because that was quite a, that's an expensive process, the post-production have to blow it up to 35 mil, have to lay a soundtrack, record, hire a composer, do a, do a score, do a sound mix, colour timing, everything to get the film done. And, um, and we got it done in 1988 for the Cannes Film Festival. It was called Bad Taste. And um, it sold really well. The, the irony is that it was the fastest selling film, uh, New Zealand film ever. New Zealand had made quite sort of worthy films, socially aware, sort of, you know, slightly arty, pretentious films to some degree and um, I come along and the uh, Film Commission have, you know, they have the job of selling all the New Zealand films at Cannes and within the space of 48 hours I th think Bad Taste has sold to, to more than 30, 30 countries had come in and bought it and we were already at that stage w way past the money, you know, we were in profit, it was like we'd gone way past what we actually spent on the film and it still gets sold now the uh, the licenses get, always get renewed and the films sort of in in constant circulation. The New Zealand Film Commission was it was, it was an odd one for them as well because they're used to getting applications you know for films about you know the the difficulties of bringing up a a, 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 a um, child by yourself after you've divorced your 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 husband or wife and you know socially conscious aware you know very they, they, the, the subjects of New Zealand films are often very bland and very boring and, and very un, uninteresting. Nobody in those days, um, no, nobody got had a had a sort of a uh, you know a feeling of, of of fantasy and imagination in the films. I, I didn't believe so. And this what film I have to say was very gory. It was a splatter movie called Bad Taste. So it was not a, it was actually something very unusual for a government film organisation to fund. I had a very good friend called Jim Booth who was the head of the, I mean he became a good friend, I, he was a sort of enemy at the beginning because he was the head of the film commission but Jim supported it and he, he later left uh, to become a producing partner with, with me so he became a good friend and he, he was the right guy at the film commission to actually do this, it was just, you know, he was a person prepared to take risks and not to um, just stick with the norm. So yeah, so I, so my career then, I, you know, I, I left the, the newspaper, left my full-time job after seven years. I left at the, at the moment that the Film Commission came in with money for me to finish it. Quit my job and I've never been back there since. Always felt well, one day I might have to go back. But I guess now I, I probably can start to put those fears to rest. I still have re recurring dreams that I, I'm back at the newspaper though, that things haven't worked out well in the film business and I'm back in the photolithography department. New Zealand didn't have a film school. New Zealand didn't have a film industry when I was starting out with my early films. I mean, I, um, you know, I, I was wanting to make movies in a country that didn't make films. Basically, didn't make anything. Um, so I think I, I you know, I, I must have been assuming when I was young that I'd have to travel overseas and I have to go to where Ray Harryhausen was if I was going to be his, his assistant or whatever, I, you know, it, it is, I had a, certainly had a feeling that you know, I wasn't able to stay in New Zealand. Um, but then when I was about 16 or 17 years old, Roger Donaldson made a movie called Sleeping Dogs, 
which was New Zealand's first real feature film. It was 1977, and it was in colour. It had Warren Oates in it. It was like a real movie. And, um, and then other filmmakers, Jeff Murphy, followed very quickly um, Goodbye Pork Pie, which was a very funny comedic film. Um, came along and then suddenly with a, with a hiss and a roar the New Zealand film industry got underway and the government formed the Film Commission and this was happening at just the right time for me because I was 17, 18 years old. I was now getting really serious with the films that I'd been making during my teenage years. I'd been making, you know, James Bond movies and all sorts of things and so I, I was really, you know, excited that there was a film industry and I tried to get a job in the film industry when I left school but I couldn't get any job at all. There wasn't, re it wasn't really, an in it's not an industry, it's just a bunch of people that make movies. I, there was nothing, no, no position I could go into that, so I, I ended up at the newspaper but, um, but anyway, by the time Bad Taste came out in, at Cannes, I was essentially a professional filmmaker at that point. I sort of ended up becoming a professional filmmaker because I got this film made in the weekends and it got sold at Cannes and it uh, made money. So suddenly I was there. And um, I wanted to keep the momentum going very quickly. I'd, I'd, met, I'd met up with some interesting people. I'd met up with Fran Walsh at this stage, um, Stephen Sinclair, another writer. And we, we, we started writing a... Um, a zombie comedy film called Brain Dead, but we couldn't get the money for that. It was too expensive, so we we had this other idea called Meet the Feebles, which was a cheaper idea based on puppets like the Muppets, uh, but puppets who do sex and drugs, and they they murder each other, and when they shoot each other, you know, squibs fire off with blood spurts out of these puppets as they get getting hit, and and it's like this very, it's very an anarchic film, very funny actually. It is very funny. Um, uh, it's the one film I screened for the cast of King Kong last year when they came down to New Zealand. I, I, I got an old printout out, out of, off the shelf and we sat down and watched The Feebles and they couldn't, they couldn't believe it. Sort of thought they should know who they're dealing with. Um, but anyway, the Meet, Meet the Feebles was um, a, 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 another one that sold well at the marketplace. That went to Mefed and sold well, made its money back very quickly, um, which enabled us to then finally get Brain Dead made, which is called Dead Alive in the US. Um, that was a, that's a very um, gory horror comedy about zombies. That was three three gory splatter movies pretty much in a row, and at that point I did feel like doing something a little different. And Fran, who had written both Feebles and and Brain Dead with me, and we were now a, a writing team, um, Fran said to me, uh, "Why don't why don't we do?" something on the Parker Hume murder case and I didn't, hadn't heard of the Parker Hume murder case and she, she she'd told me about this very famous murder case that happened in New Zealand, the South Island of New Zealand Christchurch in uh, 1954 and it involved these two teen, teenage girls that killed the mother of one of the girls, the other girl's a friend. And, but they get into this, they, 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 they're friends, their friendship builds, they get into this slightly hysterical space. They do what all kids do, they invent imaginary characters and they write stories about their imaginary kingdoms that these characters live in. They, 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 but they, they, they slowly get torn apart because one of the girl's families, Juliet's family, starts to separate and they're English so they're going to take her back to um, England. And so this friendship is going to be torn apart, and, and it's really out of the out of that grief that the, the, these two girls that have formed a very very close bond are going to be separated. Out of that grief comes a plot, a, a crazy silly plot, to murder the mother of Pauline, who was the girl who was just staying, who wasn't going to be leaving. And somehow, when they were and they were deluded, and in their minds they 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 justified that if they killed Pauline's mother, then it would put the brakes on the whole separation, and and so they. They did what is quite unthinkable, this premeditated act. They took her on a bus to some tea rooms at the top of a hill, gave her a cup of tea and a cake, and then went walking down the hill, and they walked down the hill to this track, and they had predetermined a spot where they were going to drop a plastic bauble, and, and, you know, a sort of a piece of plastic jewellery on the ground, and make the mother pick it up, and as she bent down, they were going to hit her over the head with a brick and they went through with this. It was, a, it was one of those things that you think at any time they would stop doing it, they'd pull out their chicken out, but they actually went through and they brutally murdered Pauline's mother. Um, and that was a very famous murder case in 1954. 
and the, the, the there's ramifications of it down in Christchurch still. I mean, there's a case that Christchurch doesn't like to talk about. It was very, um, it was almost seen, seen as, a, as an embarrassment to the city, the way that this is a very English upper class city, Christchurch, and, and they don't, you know, that this black, dark stain on the on the the record of the town is something that people still feel that today. But we wanted our movie to to explore the friendship and to explore the you know how this positive friendship could have ended up twisting around to this murderous act. And so that movie was um, Heavenly Creatures. Um, we got nominated for a, 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 an Oscar for screenplay on that film. And we wanted two unknown girls to play um, the two teenagers. They were 15, 16, and so we we had um, we had Melanie Linsky, who's a New Zealand girl, to play the Pauline, the Kiwi girl. Um, we just Fran just found her in a class in school. She literally Fran got so desperate because the casting directors weren't showing us people that we liked and so she got in a car and drove to schools and asked if she could go into classrooms and you know, said that she was she's casting for a film and she would just stand in the classroom and ask a girl to stand up and um, and then she'd say could you come with me and then she'd go and, and, and audition her I mean the schools were fine with this to happen it was like we was like Fran was just tearing girls out of their classrooms because we got very very desperate um, the English girl, uh, Juliet, who was 17 years old, was um, played by a 17-year-old um, a unknown actress in uh, the UK who had never made a film called Kate, Kate Winslet. And Kate Winslet's obviously gone on and made a lot more movies now, but she, this was her first film. Um, and she, she was fan fantastic to work with, obviously. And so Kate and Mel were a really great combination. They bonded pretty well, and they... Um, they got they got the th through the film helped us through the film. John Hubbard, our, our London casting director, had very good instincts in her. I remember I remember very clearly he said said to us, "Kate Winslet's going to be a big star one one day." That's what John says. He doesn't say that with hardly anybody, but he says, "Kate's going to be a big star one day." And that wasn't really for that reason because she wasn't a star now for our film. But um, we we liked her energy. She just had, she was able she had a truthfulness which is really powerful. I mean, she's very strong on emotional stuff because this was a very emotional, uh, very angst, fraught with, you know, despair, and um, she had to play all that stuff, and she's, she just does, does emotion very, very well. She's very believable, and, uh, and she taps into real things where she gen generates, you know, her tears and her, her upset. It, um, it comes from a real place. You know, often actors pretend and you can see they're pretending. And the best actors don't pretend. They actually channel some part of their selves which causes immense pain, and the pain is on their face, and the tears come out of their eyes, and they've gone there. They've gone to a dark place, whatever that is, and they are living, living the, the anguish and the pain, and they're giving that to you to film for your movie, you know, and you get it. And that's what Kate does. Uh, we were a couple about the time of Heavenly Creatures, yeah. yeah. We were friends, we were really good friends for a couple of years while we wrote Feebles and Brain Dead, and then we got together around he Heavenly Creatures time, which was really great, it was nice. I mean, I think Fran and I both um, absolutely valued the fact that we got you know, two or three years of just getting to know each other as friends, as co-workers, um, co-scriptwriters -script -script before, before anything got se serious, so it, it was good. It's given it given our relationship a really stable, solid foundation. Often the best writing is really with Fran and I just sitting on the floor, lying on the floor with a, a notepad and pen, and we we just bouncing ideas back across between each other, and she's scribbling stuff down, and I'm scribbling stuff down, um, and you know we're th trying out lines of dialogue, we're we're figuring out sort of the way the scene might flow, and we're just making notes, and then. After that, I'd just gather her notes and my notes, which which are which are almost in, indecipherable, um, and go up and I'd sit down and I'd have a go at just typing the scene into the into the computer, so we could have a look at it actually in, in the cold light of day, have a have a look at it written out as a scene, and then um, and then Fran's very good at revising. I I usually just let her sit down with the pages. There's always a you know a time where she sits down by by herself with the with the written pages and starts revising and starts changing and because that's where a lot of the skill of script writing is it's not in actually getting the script written it's it's the revising afterwards it's the endless endless revisions 
And Fran's strength is that she's fantastic at uh, at picking the weaknesses out of a script and um, and just revising it and revising it and revising it till we're happy with it. So. We're um, we're doing an a, um, adapt adaptation of the Lovely Bones, Alice Siebold's book. Um, we we just bought the rights to the book ourselves. We we're not attached to any studio, which is an unusual way of doing it because normally you know, even for the fact that the, the book's rights cost quite a lot of money, you you go to a studio and partner with them and they get the book. But of course at that we wanted to avoid everything that comes of that because at that point they have a expectation of delivering a script an expectation of a date that the film's going to be, they even figure out the date they're going to release the film, and suddenly you're on the machine again. And we just had been on the, on the, the gr grind for 10 years, basically, you know, the grinding film machine where you're laying the tracks in front of the train the whole time and the things coming down behind you. And, you know, with Kong following the three Lord of the Rings films, it, it was 10 years of that. and. We literally wanted to wake up in the morning for a while and not have anybody expecting something from us, not having a script that people are waiting for, not having a, um, you know, uh, show up on the scoring stage, show up at the at Weta to talk about effects. It just just wanted to have a period where, where our, our calendars weren't, wasn't packed with meetings and expectations of us to have to perform and do things. and so. The, the only way we could, could avoid that was just to, to option the book ourselves with, it, with our own money, which we did. And so now nobody is telling us how quickly, how slow or fast we have to write the script, and we're really enjoying it. It's making for a better script in actual fact because we're, we really feel we're writing it, this one for us. We don't know who the company is. We obviously will eventually you know, make the film with a, with a studio, um, but we don't even know who, who that studio is yet. So at the moment it feels like we're just doing, doing it for ourselves, which is a lovely feeling. And um, and it gives you a lot more freedom in writing the script too. We we sort of don't have to worry about some the fact somebody's going to read this in three weeks. Oh my God, you know you sort of tend to get self conscious about it. And the Lovely Bones is is a story in which I think everybody who reads the book probably takes different things from it. And I think what's important is that Fran and I get to write a script that very clearly and vividly describes the the movie that we see being made because I think it, that's important for this project that we're all on the same page. And I think the danger with The Lovely Bones would be writing a script with a, with a studio attached and you end up with a completely different film than the studio was imagining. And then suddenly they're saying, well, but can't we change this and can't we change that? And, I, and we just really want to have the script in a state that's you know, not going to happen immediately. It'll, it'll take several drafts, but get the script in a state that we're comfortable and we've arrived at the film that we want to make and then go to different companies at that point with the script and we'll we'll simply go with the co company that we think you know is supportive and responds to the script that they read we've had an impact um to a degree i mean tourism in new zealand has certainly um you know exploded since the lord of the rings films came out um there, there is a, a little bit more activity in the local industry. That's the industry that I want to see helped is the is the New Zealand filmmakers trying to get their films made. And um, there's, there, you know, the government have put more money into filmmaking. They, they seem to, see, they do ser seriously understand the benefits that a film can bring to a country now. And I think it maybe took Lord of the Rings to happen before they, they fully appreciated that. And so they are, you know, they are working on supporting local filmmakers with a little bit more vigour than what has happened in the past. And at the same time, Lord of the Rings is bringing down a lot of overseas productions, like you know, Narnia came down to shoot, and there's, you know, there's sort of an endless stream of um, of films coming down to New Zealand to to use New Zealand as a production base because they realise that uh, we've got the scenery and we've got the technical expertise.